Chess Space 26. Yes, it's happening. And very, very soon we have it in the store. And with me today, Matthias Brunviva, the engineer, the inventor, the mastermind behind all of those things here, of those products for such a long time already. I'm very happy to talk with you about a couple of new features. But first of all, um, one thing I, I need to know about is Chess Space 26. Last time uh, it was a different number. Did we skip some versions or what happened? Well, we are going now to a, a yearly circle for many reasons. It's more natural and harmonious to do that. And uh, so we are just calling it by the year we publish it in. And it will be the year 26 when it will be available. So we call it Chess Space 26, but actually it is the 19th version of exactly. Chess Space. Mm -hmm. And it will be available for you at home very soon, in a couple of days already. So make sure you will check the store. We will talk about some of the features. And one of the most exciting things, definitely, is the opening report on all the opening functions. There have been uh, loads of new features. It feels like a living encyclopedia. What have you done? <laughs> well. Uh, it's, it's, of course, not the first uh, chess version that somehow deals with opening theory or opening preparation. But we are quite proud and I'm, I'm really happy about this function because it manages to give some really fresh and new insights into openings and the way you should uh, train openings and you should get familiar with new openings or maybe with, maybe with the lines you play since many, many years. Let me give you a couple of examples. Normal Opening th the preparation would uh, uh, look at statistics, how many people have played a move, what's the most frequent continuation, then at the score, is the move performing well, or of course at engine and evalu evaluations. A lot of numbers, dry numbers. Chespers 26 opening report tries some new, fresh things. For example, it tries to extract instructive games about a line. Mm -hmm. First of all, it identifies, of course, the frequent lines, and then it tries to identify the instructive games, which games which you should replay to really understand an opening. You see a Mega26 database contains more than 10 million games, and then you have, in a, in a favorite opening variation, you may have four or 5,000 games. You're not going to replay all of them, <laughs> but the program tells you what to look at. Secondly, it tries to extract uh, Typical plans, typical maneuvers, things which are always recurring uh, independently of the variation. So you do not learn it by heart, you, you learn it by understanding the position. And thirdly, and this is my favorite, I could spend hours with this, is it ext extracts the typical tactical motives from the games. Mm. So if you have a moderately sharp opening, an advanced line maybe, then it will extract maybe 50 or 60 training positions. And all those training positions are very close to the opening system you're studying. Okay. There. You can see it in the pawn structure and the position. Ah, of course, this is this variation. And so you immediately learn the typical motives. It's very useful, not only for blitz chess on a server. It's very useful if you see this ahead of your opponent, what tactical motives are there. And it's fun to train it. Definitely. Um, I've been checking it out and one of the most fascinating things for me as a club player is my niveau is uh, 1800 to 2100 and uh, people, strong players, often tell me, Arnie, just get rid of those gambit things. It's just messing up everything. According to the statistics, uh, it's a broken opening. You cannot play this. But Chess Space 26 gives me hope to actually enforce those openings. Is this a good thing or is it a bad thing? A very true and I actually uh, I'm in the business since a long time and I'm completely surprised about these insights, the statistical insights which we can deduce from the opening report. Mm -hmm. And the gist is that uh, you have to look at openings completely different, com differently from different playing strengths perspectives. For example, what might be good for a grandmaster might be pretty bad even for a club player. And vice versa, a variation that is quite successful on club level uh, might not, be, not, not work at all at 2600 plus level. Mm. For example, Dutch defense, Stonewall, very popular with 1800, 1900 players. I'm always a bit afraid as white, oh, Stonewall, ooh, Black's gonna attack me, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that. Stonewall is 
practically is nearly lost on GM level. Mm -hmm. And nobody plays it. If mm -hmm. you look at the, the 2600 statistics, Stonewall, it's not played for good reason. Just all these dark square weaknesses. It's bad. It's considered debunked. Literally. Yeah, but yeah. it's a yeah. good, uh, for a 1900 player, it's a successful yeah. variation. It's really good. Or to be uh, to, uh, Scandinavian, fantastic opening against 1e4 because you have very narrow theory. Scandinavian is really problematic for top players, mm -hmm. but it's a solid and valid opening for 1900 <laughs> players. And there are many, many more examples like that. Mm. Martial attack for wide club level, it's nearly lost. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite okay for wide uh, 2600 players. Mm. And the problem is opening theory as we perceive it, as we read it, as we see it in, in magazines, in books, in videos, in live commentary. This opening theory is heavily biased, for good reason, towards the strong players. Mm. Because of course, if they play more objectively, if they play strong, uh, strong and correct. But club players can't handle positions like that. Mm. They can't handle a position like a GM does. And this implicates many, many practical things which make completely different opening systems well playable and successful. Mm -hmm. Best variation against 1e4? Guess it. Sicilian. Okay. Clearly the best on club level. Very clearly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is, that is actually really fascinating. I'm uh, very looking forward to digging into this for several <laughs> hours. That is for sure. And uh, one thing is that some of the, us have favorite players. We're watching the live uh, games and we see different openings and they are in fashion, that's the thing. But there's also work uh, been done in Chess Space 26 about what is an opening which is in fashion and for how long and why. It's pretty surprising. I mean, uh, of course, I had, for example, I had phases in my life where I did, I did a lot of openings training and so on. I, I got stuck on this level, on this repertoire, maybe 30 year old <laughs> repertoire or so. And it's pretty outdated when I look at this. Nobody plays my lines anymore. <laughs> So it's very interesting to see that your lines might be in fashion or completely out of fashion. And it's, it's very fascinating to see what actually gets into fashion. For me, an interesting example, which I didn't know at all, Knight of Sicilian, for example, sixth move of white. When I learned chess, everybody played bishop g5. Later, you had bishop e3. But now a move is, which is heavily in fashion is 6h3, a mm -hmm. good example. And so, why 6h3? Very interesting. It's just something I discovered en passant while looking uh, at, at these variations. And I have dozens such little discoveries which really fascinate uh, me and make a lot of fun. And, and other discoveries, oh, where I ask myself, why is no, nobody playing this anymore? <laughs> this, is, and this is really interesting. And then you mm. start looking at the lines and I see, ah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, this is bad because of, you look at the instructive games, and then suddenly you understand it. And this is an information you do not really get out of other media about chess theory. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think this is a striking, powerful element of this opening report. When we're talking about the uh, history of chess or historical openings, and there have been some names which are kind of the inventors of certain openings. And this is also an element of Chess Base 26. It's actually, it feels like a storytelling feature. Was this on purpose or is it just for statistics? Yeah, we stumbled a bit into this. And, uh, um, I, you know, I think that um, openings are an inherent part of chess culture. Chess wouldn't be as successful as it is today if it wouldn't have this very strong cultural element of these traditions about these recognizable openings. And so I think the history of a variation belongs somehow uh, to the variation, even if you, for practical persons, you don't have to know who first played the Evans Gambit. Actually, it was Evans who played. <laughs> 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 okay, <laughs> which is not always the case. So, True. so we try to extract by looking at statistics, which strong player really played uh, the variation first on some kind of important event and, and stuck to it, not just once, mm -hmm. played it maybe two or three times or so. And then you get the pioneers of the opening. And mm. the wonderful thing is that there are many, many examples, uh, the majority of all those named openings, 
which come out fine, but the opening report says, for example, inventor of the Banco Gambit, Pal Banco. It's not coded in the program, it's just the, the program deduces this by looking at the games. Mm -hmm. Inventor of the Botvinnik system in the Slav, Michael Botvinnik. It's, and they have many, many examples like this. Evans Gambit, first important game, Evans against McDonald, for example, mm. 1829, and so on and so on. And of course, we have the player encyclopedia. We can then present a picture, an old picture of the player at the time when he played this variation. And so it's a very colorful and lively entry into this whole statistical report thing. Mm. Much, much more about this you will see in a future video. Be subscribed to this channel to see more about these infos, of course. But there's another thing uh, besides all of those new opening features, which you will talk in depth in the video. And uh, it's called the Monte Carlo analysis. Now, are we playing poker or chess or what is happening here? What is, what is, what is that thing? Well, we're actually visiting a casino in Monte Carlo. It's a, it's a, a standard term in science. When you do a random experiments, stochastic experiments, then you call it Monte Carlo methods. Mm -hmm. And in chess Monte Carlo, which is actually a quite often, quite frequently employed in, in chess, computer chess, is a method where you have a position, normally an opening position for us, um, and uh, you play out thousands of games in that position. Mm -hmm. So to make it practicable, you have to play those games quickly. And in chess there's 26, one game in a Monte Carlo match would, for example, take at most one second. And then we take all cores of the processor and play on all cores parallel so that you get many thousand games in a few seconds about a position. And you can deduce really interesting things from this. Let me give you an example. Imagine a very sharp middle game position, which is open, uh, bad king safety, and it somehow ends in a perpetual check. I Sounds familiar. Say. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, really sharp position. Maybe one side sacrificed something. Evaluation of a powerful engine like Stockfish, 0 0.00. Yeah. So, what does this tell us? Is this a dead draw? Of course not. It's super sharp. And here, Monte Carlo comes in. Monte Carlo tells you the winning probability for both sides, mm. the drawing width of the position, and other things. And this is so much more interesting than a simple number, which the normal classical evaluation uh, gives you. For example, what we do, and I think this might be completely new in Chessbase 26, we now look at those games, at those thousands of games played in a few seconds, and we try to extract typical piece maneuvers from them. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have score statistics. We can deduce what kind of maneuver, let's say of your Knight G1 is successful, is more successful than other maneuvers. And so if you then take your mouse cursor and hover on the, on the knight on G1, it will then draw arrows on the board and show those typical maneuvers. And then you can see, aha, I'm closed Spanish, my knight has to go to F5 from B1. And it deduces this information from the games, and this is pretty interesting. Indeed. It now, I have to ask a question which I didn't write down yet, but it comes to mind. All of this sounds as if we now need a supercomputer or like <laughs> an engine which is like heavily strong and whatever. Is this the case? Uh, we, we have, I mean, normal, we have to, normal PCs nowadays are supercomputers. We mm -hmm. have this in, in standard machines. I haven't updated my, my machine since two and a half years now, I think. And it's, it's a standard AMD Ryzen processor with, with the 12 cores, and it's pretty powerful for this kind of mm -hmm. thing. We all have those machines with multiple cores which can do those tasks. It's an interesting question because uh, our duty is, I think, um, is to, uh, to make use of the hardware power that we can expect users to have. So we are, we are heavily investing when we, or when we code stuff like Chessbase 26 in trying to make things parallel. Excuse me for the short technical things, but it might be interesting for many, for many viewers. Mm -hmm. You see, you have all those cores in your CPU which yeah. you buy. And this is expensive. You pay a lot of money for your CPU. And then you are annoyed if you start Chessbase and you see, oh, they are using only a small fraction of it, like a word processor. And we always try to use 
all processors to make things fast. Two striking examples in, in Chessbase 26. One is Monte Carlo analysis. You can configure it to run on all CPUs. Mm -hmm. Many games in a short time, high statistical significance. Second example is in the opening report. Uh, you, it might sound horrifying if I tell you we extract all the tactical positions from thousands of games, but we use it by heavy parallelization. And I'm proud of it, how we do that. Excellent. One final question I have to ask you, of course, Chessbase 26, which of all those functions are you as a chess player using the most often or frequently at the moment? Well, I'm actually keen uh, about anything which has to do with calculation and tactics. And uh, in Chessbase 26, I always get stuck in the tactics section of the opening <laughs> report. And this is really, I'm, I'm telling myself, okay, I have to test this, so I have to look at these positions. Are they correct? Did the program find the correct position here? Does it belong to the opening? But I have to solve it. I mean, I could also start the engine and see if it's correct. <laughs> but I really, I really like this little satisfaction that it gives you to, even if it's just a simple and obvious bishop sacrifice on h7 or h2 or so. And of course, there's a lot of trivial stuff in there because this is practical chess. But it's important and, and I really love this and I'm proud of this that we did this new function and it's fun and it improves your playing strengths. And there's so, so much more and we didn't even touch uh, the glimpse, but we will have follow-up videos about all of this. And of course, you can check it out yourself very soon. Matthias, thank you so much thank for you your time. Are.